Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. So, this is one of the series from the ISOC, again, the fifth series lecture from ISOC Research Center of APU. And Today's speaker, let me introduce today's speaker is Dr. Nicole, and she is an associate professor from pharmacology, and she is also a director of Lisher's in Institute for Pharmacological Innovation. And she is leading the team, and she is also from D. Monford University Lisher's of UK. And she is an eminent scientist with vast research knowledge experience by leading the UK and European research institutes. And she is also interested in signal mechanism implicated in neurodegeneration, genetic and pharmacology disease intervention. She is also entangled in charities and pharma industries and small biotech industries. And she has been graduated as a doctorate from University of Bucharest, Romania in the field of biophysics. And she has also enhanced her knowledge by executing her postdoctorate research in Nimir MRC London, UK. And she is also a MRC toxic unit from Deshas University, UK. She joined D. Monford University as an associate professor in pharmacology and become the director of Lisher's University Institute of Pharmaceutical Innovation at D. Monford University in 2018. And she has a vast experience in different research projects and few examples or she has been conducting research in digital LIO, which she was able to reduce the carbon dioxide emission 
and the manufacturing of freeze drying process through which the manufacturing process can be injectable of drugs which is of 35 percentage and some of the other examples like working with the small biotech and patient groups to identify the personalized treatment in rare disease will highlight how academic research impact can cause a certain treatment with a rare disease and how it can be effectively implemented and she has done her research in this particular fields which enhance her knowledge so today our eminent scientists and the research speakers with us to join us to provide her knowledge whatever she has experienced and gain knowledge from the research that she has done and she'll be throwing for the knowledge for next 60 minutes so where we all be looking on the research that she has done and how it has been implemented and she also has a knowledge of how the sustainable lity can be implemented by using different new inventions and how it has been implemented in different projects so in our lecture she'll be explaining about the sustainability and how it can be implemented in different projects that can be sustainable for the future right and now it's time for me to welcome dr nicoleta to provide her the eminent speech for us welcome dr nicoleta on stage thank you for joining us and do i do thank for you providing your valuable time to share the knowledge with us thank you for yeah, inviting me you. and um, i'm looking forward for our discussion today i'd like to share my slides um, hello everyone welcome to uh, this discussion today thank you for inviting me so today I'm going to discuss about how academic research and innovation has a transformative potential for sustainable pharma growth and pharmaceutical innovation. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to introduce to you Leicester Institute for Innovation from Molecules to Practice. I will discuss about sustainability in pharmaceutical innovation. And I'm going to present a number of case studies from the research and innovation projects that are developed in our institute, which are impacting sustainable growth in pharmaceutical innovation. I'd like to mention that many of these projects are being developed by my colleagues, and I will acknowledge uh, which person is uh, working on a specific subject. So Leicester Institute for Pharmaceutical Innovation from Molecules to Practice has been uh, developed in the last few years, starting from researchers that are part of Leicester School of Pharmacy and the School of Allied Health. And our research focus is to have to use multidisciplinary approaches for the study of medicines, healthcare products and services. And we are uh, developing a range of topics that are looking at drug discovery, drug manufacturing and delivery, pharmacology, analytical science, forensic science and toxicology, but we are also looking at clinical applications alongside education and training of uh, colleagues that are going to work in these areas. We have um, developed this institute based on seven research groups, and I'm going to present to you some of the projects that are being uh, developed in these groups. So for the purpose of our discussion today, the group of pharmaceutical technologies and nanomedicine is perhaps uh, one of the most relevant. And as the name uh, mentions, we are looking here at technologies that are being developed for different drug delivery and manufacturing processes. I'd like to mention here uh, the work from Professor Ming Zong Li, who is looking at crystal engineering and formulation science. And uh, one of his most important recent projects is looking at developing new uh, ways of delivery of artemisicin, which is a drug that is very important for the treatment of malaria. 
So this drug has been developed, has been discovered a few years ago as being um, very effective in treatment of malaria, but the drug on its own has very low uh, bioavailability. And what uh, Professor Ming Zongli is doing, he's uh, using this drug in combination with methodologies that are incorporating the drug in co-crystallization methods and is obtaining new ways of delivering the drug which enhance the bioavailability of this compound. And this has been very successful and is now already published and it is in work with a company to be delivered as a drug on the market. Other projects from the group um, are looking at um, innovation uh, to develop bio-inspired peptides, soft nanomaterials for my biomedical applications. And some of these applications are um, delivery of viral vaccine, uh, anti-cancer drug delivery, but also at development of materials for wound healing. An important project, which I will discuss a little bit later, is about freeze drying and uh, localization which is being developed by Professor Jeff Smith. Um, another area of research that is relevant for our discussion today is um, tissue regeneration in which Dr. Omar Kutachi is working with a focus on the liver regeneration. Another important group um, from our institute is the research group looking at chemistry for health and environment. And a few projects that I'd like to mention to you today are NMR analysis of biomedical and environmental samples, which is pursued by Professor Martin Grotveld. He's developing metabolomics methods to find um, metabolic pathways that are distinctive in neurodegenerative diseases, cancer and metabolic diseases. But he's also looking at cooking oils, and he has done a lot of um, work in this area with high impact, demonstrating how uh, different oils with different uh, components are important to be used in certain conditions so that they don't become toxic. He's also looking at components in, the med in medically relevant materials, for example, those that are used in dental treatments. Another project in this group uh, by Professor Katrin Hadersman is looking at a novel catalyst system. And I will um, discuss more about this in uh, the next few slides. And um, this catalyst system has a potential to be used in treatment of wastewater, uh, also in the disinfection of contact, contact lenses. Other projects are um, developed for uh, studying medication adherence by Professor Sangita Tana, and she's able to detect with uh, mass spectrometry uh, whether a patient adheres to a certain treatment just by using a single blood drop. Also, Dr. Tiziana Sgama is um, developing methods, DNA-based tests, to um, authenticate medicinal plant materials. And this is a very important uh, piece of work to distinguish whether uh, treatments uh, like uh, uh, teas are having the right components in them, uh, like um, different uh, cinnamon, for example, uh, spices have the right components in those uh, samples. The group of pharmacology in which I work uh, is actually looking at the biology behind diseases and what are the pharmacological approaches that can be um, derived from these studies to treat diseases. Uh, most of my work is focused on uh, enhancing mitochondrial stress signaling and quality control as a th therapeutic strategy in uh, neurodegeneration and I will discuss about this a bit more later. I have other colleagues working in similar um, areas but not focused on mitochondria, but they are working on glycolipids. We also look at uh, gut microbiome brain interactions in Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative diseases. The models that we are uh, using for this research are cell-derived models, 
including stem cells derived neurons and glia on their own or in co-culture. We are also using the fruit fly as a model of disease because it has uh, numerous advantages given its uh, short lifespan and the easy uh, way to work with it. But we are also using mouse models for uh, certain uh, disease relevant projects. Uh, we have an important group that is looking at infectious disease. And um, our colleague Maitre Shiv Kumar has joined DMU uh, just probably a year before the pandemic. And in that context, she developed a strong um, virology uh, project, and she's looking at host pathogen interactions in the co context of drug discovery. And I will present to you some of her work a bit later. Other projects in the group are looking at how to treat biofilm associated with infections at childhood, childhood infections, but also there are projects related to drug discovery in tuberculosis. Most importantly, we also have um, a group that is uh, looking at pharmacy practice. And um, this pharmacy practice group has developed um, both projects that are laboratory based and are looking at pharmaceutical properties of uh, various antimicrobials, but they are also doing work um, in practice, looking at how uh, certain therapeutic approaches uh, are effective in the context of the various diseases. Um, so you have seen that we cover a range of projects. Uh, I didn't mention all of them, but um, in, in the context of sustainable development, we are covering um, a number of subjects uh, from health and well-being, quality education, industry innovation and infrastructure, peace, justice and strong institutions. And we also touch on some of the other um, sustainable development goals. Because our uh, research is so multidisciplinary and is involving national and international networks, uh, we are using high profile technologies and expertise um, and this research has very strong uh, societal impact. It is also the basis of our research informed teaching. So in terms of sustainable development, we have um, a very um, wide reach and um, importance. In terms of sustainability in pharmaceutical innovation, um, pharmaceutical industry uh, and here we are talking about big pharmaceutical industry, but also uh, small uh, pharmaceutical uh, units, they need to uh, develop, develop sustainability at three levels, financial performance, social aspects, and environmental benefits. And that involves management of environmental, social, and financial concerns, involves development of a strategy to reduce negative impact that may result from their operation. And they also need to have um, the ability to measure what they improve in terms of um, environment, social and governance. So they have to develop metrics for these parameters. But I think the most important part for the discussion today is how we contribute to their development for their sustainable growth. And in order to address that, I would start from discussing a little bit the key steps in the development of new drugs and treatment approaches. So you may know that the discovery of new drugs involves a number of steps. Um, starting from the discovery and development, preclinical research, clinical research, regulatory review and approval, and post-market monitoring. And I have pointed here the steps where our projects are fitting most. What is important to note is that all these steps, at least the first three, 
are taking very long time. So for discovery and development, uh, there is a process of target identification and validation, assay development, high throughput screen, identification, identification of uh, the lead target and the drug candidate. When I talk about target in this context, I mean a molecule in the cells that can be targeted by a drug, and this targeting would lead to an increase or decrease in activity, and then we aim with this change of activation to improve a certain disease condition. The second step of the discovery and development is the chemical development, and this is where the pharmaceutical technology group uh, works most, and that involves chemical development, uh, development of pharmaceutical formulations, development of delivery methods, and also development of manufacturing. So how do we contribute to these steps? I think the most important is the target identification and validation. So large, this is, um, this is a step that takes many years of work and large companies uh, they do have their own development um, and research programs. However, for a certain disease, there may be numerous targets and they cannot um, really focus on everything. They need to select a number of targets. So what happens then in the context of uh, interaction between academia and pharma? Um, researchers that have an idea that a target might be important for a certain disease, they may get uh, collaborations with industry and the industry is supporting um, a certain part of the development of that idea. So this is one way for us to participate in the process. Then uh, the same thing happens for uh, delivery of a method development and also for uh, the development of pharmaceutical formulation. So this is a very long process and this is why basically uh, pharma would outsource this work to academia. It is saving them time, it is saving them money as well, and they use expertise that they do not need to develop in-house because it would be very expensive to, to do everything and to know everything. We also work in the preclinical research validation and this is where we use animal models, cellular models, which I have mentioned before, and we are able to inform on dosing and toxicity. So this is again part of um, the collaboration with industry. When an idea has been developed, the industry wants to have it up to the preclinical um, research done outside of their own um, unit, and they prefer to outsource some of this work. Clinical research, as you may know from um, what we have seen now with the COVID pandemic, takes a long time, takes between five and ten years. In the pandemic, that has been um, shortened for uh, obvious reasons, but typically drugs are taking five to ten years from the validation in preclinical research to the clinical validation. Then <clears throat> the regulatory bodies review the data and approve it or not for use. Another step where we uh, are able to support is the post-market monitoring, because every drug needs to be monitored long-term to provide information and supports further developments. And one example that I can give on this is that um, our pharmacy practice group is doing audits in uh, GP practice and they are looking at um, how the use of inhalers is um, done and how different patients with different comorbidities are using this and what is their effect. So we are involved in this type of work. So as I mentioned, I would like to... Um, present a few case studies. I will also show some of my research, but I think that for the discussion today, there are quite a, uh, quite a few interesting projects that are being developed in the Leicester Institute for Pharmaceutical Innovation. 
and that are relevant for this discussion. So I'll start with Digital Leo, an Innovate UK industrial research project, which is developed by Professor Jeff Smith. So this work resides in the area of freeze drying and lyophilization. So um, what is important to mention here is that numerous uh, drugs, about 40% of biologically based products have to be freeze dried. So it's a process of preserving the drug, making it available for a long time. It's a process that is commonly used for large molecules, but also for small molecules like penicillin uh, and microorganisms. It is also used for various blood products. So in the process of lyophilization, there are a few steps that are important. One of them is freezing. The sample is completely frozen, typically in a glass vial or in a flask. Then it requires a step with, that involves vacuum and also drying. So the liquid that is in the sample, either water or solvent, has to be completely removed in this uh, vacuum and drying step. This is a lengthy process. And um, in order to be sure that these steps have been completed, it usually takes a, a long time. So the cycle for this freeze drying process is quite long. It can be up to 48 hours. It involves high energy consumption and CO2 emission. It requires special facilities and good manufacturing practice methodologies. So reducing the cycle reduces energy consumption and CO2 emission. Process analytical technologies are also required to give more effective endpoints at the various stages. So what Professor Jeff Smith has done in a number of projects over the years, he has developed this technique, which is called true vial impedance spectroscopy with which he's able to monitor the stage of the process of the freeze drying. So basically, the technology enables non-invasive, real-time monitoring of the process. And also, more, most importantly, it doesn't need to put a sample or a probe inside the vial. The, measurement is non-invasive, so it takes place on the outside of the vial. So this project that he's uh, starting now, which has been just approved, called Digital Leo, is uh, aiming to develop new models and process analytics for um, ensuring that uh, the freeze-drying process is controlled. So here he's trying to link uh, physical parameters related to the freezing to the uh, dry layer resistance and to build empirical models to predict um, the timing from the freezing data. Apart from the TV's um, technology, he's also combining other technologies like uh, Raman and near infrared spectroscopy to determine um, other parameters related to secondary drying moisture content and uh, the endpoints in the drier uh, drying process. So how he has developed this uh, project, which is now funded by Innovate UK, he has put uh, together a network that comprises two large companies, AstraZeneca and Siemens, and three small uh, to medium enterprises, SMEs, uh, and also is involved the medicine and healthcare products re regulatory agency. So the Mont for uh, marketed by Micron Design. Uh, the other companies they also contribute with some of the technologies that is involved in the monitoring of the process, vapor sensor and Raman. And the large companies, AstraZeneca is doing lab evaluation, Siemens is doing process modeling and scaling up of the technology, 
while the healthcare agency is looking also at laboratory evaluation. So how, what do we get from this project? The aim is to develop a shorter cycle by knowing the endpoints of each step and by removing waiting times. So for a 48 hour cycle, reducing by five hours, it's 10% efficiency gain. And also, mod it need is, the project is modeling to predict equipment settings and drive the process forward aggressively, also to save time. So given that we have mentioned that is a, a process that is uh, energy, uh, energy demanding and also produces CO2, all these efficacy uh, gains, they will impact the sustainable production um, of uh, drugs in the process, in the manufacturing process. And all this will support the pharma that is interested to have this process uh, developed. So what uh, we have done here, VMU, has uh, provided the innovative process measurement solution which is a unique non-invasive technology. DMU has conceived the project, established the network, wrote the bid expert and expertise, and uh, has been successful with a really high scores. So I think this is an important reflecting how, how um, our uh, research is impacting pharma growth sustainably. Um, another uh, type of work that I wanted to mention today, which is developed by uh, Professor Val Valkyria Schlingwein, is uh, developing quality by design methodologies for uh, different manufacturing and um, drug development processes. So she has been working on this for numerous years and she has led also our uh, quality by design uh, courses in master courses and she's organizing every year um, a school or um, a big conference involving numerous uh, pharmaceutical companies and um, just to give you some uh, information about the quality by design uh, process it's a systematic approach uh, that aims to understand the process of drug manufacturing and to see where things can be improved to improve both the quality of the product but also the efficacy of the project. It is based on science and quality risk management and uh, it is an area of work that has been uh, developed over many years. What is important to say is that this process has been started probably in the 70s when um, pharmaceutical companies noted that they had high um, percentage of the products that were not of good quality and the quality by design process increased the good quality of products from one in 100 um, defective product to one in one million. So that has improved uh, processes a lot and it keeps the being developed and it's still one of the key um, areas that is being uh, developed in manufacturing uh, of drugs so that uh, it supports the development, the sustainable development and growth of pharmaceutical companies. Um, there are a number of uh, benefits of this process. Um, what happens is uh, you ha we have the inputs of the process and then processes have, can be adjusted and enabled um, by uh, process analytical technologies to provide a greater understanding of the process and consistent outputs. So the benefits of this approach is that it's a real-time approach that can give information about uh, what happens in the process of drug uh, production. It is using integrated system approach it is risk-based and leads to process understanding. Um, so it is involving 
very strict um, steps. It's a risk-based approach to justify development of decision. It's making most of the knowledge about the process and uh, what we want to obtain. And it's avoiding um, surprises and it's reducing time for development. Um, these processes, uh, as I mentioned, they reduce cost and they increase the overall effectiveness of the drug discovery, of the drug manufacturing process. So, um, some of the key uh, steps that are uh, involved in this are also uh, related to what is important for the patient and how the patient is um, related to the properties of the drug that we are doing. And that links to the dose, the appearance, the hardness, the dissolution and content uniformity. So all these properties are taken into account when uh, the analysis of the process is made, when the risk assessment is made. So in summary, the QBD development involves analysis of the quality of the product, what is the therapeutic aim, what is what we want from the drug, what is the uniformity, stability. There is a risk assessment process which contains uh, the, the attributes of the um, process parameters and of the materials that are involved. Uh, digital, digitalization and experimental design are key to this um, process and the process involves statistical analysis, multivariate analysis to develop uh, the design model. There is a control strategy to be implemented so that in line with um, what we want to obtain, there is a scale up and tra uh, technical transfer. And um, the life cycle of this um, methodology is continuous because uh, it's including continuous improvement. As an example of this type of work that Valkyria is doing, she has worked with Kindeva to improve some of the process control for pharmaceutical cleaning, batching, and manufacturing that is taking place at Kindeva. And I'll just show you a few things here. Um, she has uh, employed QBD design principles and tool expertise to improve cleaning, batching, and manufacturing steps at Kindeva. Um, cleaning control, for example, is very important because it uh, protects the patient, pre pre uh, prevents the product recall, loss of profit, and legal disputes. And the methodology that they have used involved um, use of UV, visible spectrophotometry, uh, and able to analyze the compound in a flow cell, so at very small scale, so that they could detect whether uh, what was the uh, purity of the product. So they have done this for uh, two compounds, salbutamol and uh, beclometazone. They had a certain peak for that was known for the uh, spectra of the two compounds. The compound was analyzed uh, by being moved into a flow cell that had the probe for the spectrophotometry um, included in it. So they have been able to develop this technology. They have also been able to use this uh, technology for uh, batching uh, control. So they have designed the condition and the parameters that are uh, safe for uh, producing a certain drug in batches. So the technical findings and scientific findings of this project was that they can accurately detect and quantify acceptable residue limits they can uh, confirm the active pharmaceutical in the ingredients. They can monitor progression and completion of drug dissolution. And these flow cells can be optimized uh, for the intended application. So what I'd like to uh, do next is to discuss with you a little bit about um, my work. And I will present two types of um, projects that I have developed. One that is developed with 
large pharmaceutical companies and one that is working with small biotechs and uh, patient organization for identification of personalized treatments in rare diseases. And I would like to point out what's the difference between working in these two settings. So my work uh, is focused in mitochondrial nucleus communication and the role of mitochondrial quality control and DNA damage signaling in neurodegenerative disease. And I'm doing a number of different projects in this area. One of them was uh, to validate um, the ability of a certain molecule that resides in the mitochondria called CLPP to um, induce, when activated, a mitochondrial quality control pathway that is um, neuroprotective. Another one is the one looking at phenotyping mitochondria nucleus communication in chromosome 8p disorders, which I will present a bit later. And I also have other projects related to microglia immunometabolism and microbiome brain interactions. So the work on validation of CLPP dependent activation of mitochondria quality control as a neuroprotective strategy has been um, started a number of years ago. And the way that worked is I had a hypothesis that CLPP can be involved in mitochondrial, in enhancing mitochondrial quality control when activated because it initiates a signaling mechanism that is protective for a disease condition. It took a number of years for me to um, demonstrate this hypothesis in various cellular and drosophila models of Parkinson's disease. So after these years of work, having validated the target in a number of models and demonstrating that the signaling mechanism that I think it works, it does work, and also identifying a number of drugs that are able to activate CLPP and validating them. So then I went for additional funding from this um, Alzheimer Research UK Dementia Consortium, which is backed by um, a number of pharmaceutical companies. When they have an interest on a certain target, they sponsor this research. So what the project with them was, was a validation in preclinical models which involves um, stem cells derived models. So the big pharma, so they want the target to be uh, clearly identified and they want the target to have a certain characterized mechanism. And they also want the drugs that are activating that target to be specific. So these are kind of some of the key requirements for development of a preclinical study um, in the context of working with a pharma company. So the contact in this context, pharma, big pharma works from discovery to patient. Okay. So they are interested in the mechanism, the selectivity, and um, when they have something that is clearly doing what we think it's doing, then they look at the next steps for uh, clinical validation. But the other project that I have mentioned um, is working to phenotype mitochondria nucleus communication in chromosome 8p disorders. So I would like, okay, so um, chromosome 8p disorder is a rare disease that affects about 550 people worldwide. And uh, patients start to manifest problems in childhood. Uh, they have problems in development, uh, both neuronal development, uh, cognitive development, and also in uh, physical development. So the problem here in treating these patients is that because there are not that many, big pharmaceutical companies very rarely get involved in trying to develop um, a treatment for these diseases. The other problem is that in this kind of diseases, each patient has a different type of mutation. So basically, you have to work with an N of one. 
So it is an unmet clinical need for treatment of these diseases. Obviously, um, as I mentioned, these uh, diseases are discovered in children first. And parents have started to organize themselves in what we call patient organizations. They bring together small biotech, academic research and clinicians, and they engage uh, all these units to try to find a, a treatment and to test that really for an N of one, for one child. So the, treat, the focus here is uh, on treatment innovation and not so much on the target. Because of the urgency of this, of finding of a treatment for these children, uh, the process is not to engage in a full drug discovery process for each individual, which I mentioned it takes 20 years or more. Because there is no time, so we want to have something as soon as possible to be able to improve the condition of the patients. So the strategy is to use drug repurposing. So now, these days, the science has evolved um, that much that we have libraries of thousands of drugs that we can screen and see if they have a positive effect in a certain condition. So in this type of approach, we work from patient to discovery. So what uh, I have done in this context, <clears throat> we have worked at DMU with the Project AP uh, organization to find specific cellular phenotypes in fibroblasts from 8P patients. And we have identified a number of um, parameters that are different in 8P cells comparing to control cells. And we have made a recommendation for a drug screening protocol. So this drug repurposing screening will be outsourced to a company that has a library of a few thousand products and has the capacity to do um, thousands of samples at the same time. Once this is um, finished, we are going to be involved in the validation of some of these uh, products. Our work is also combined with work from other projects, trying to look at potential targets and signaling mechanisms. Um, and I would like to just show um, to share my screen and show you a couple of things that we have done about this. Uh, Okay, so I hope, hope you can see my screen. So this is the, the web page of the Project 8P Foundation, and you can see some of the children that are actually participating in these studies. So they are our heroes, they donate their samples, and we hope to um, find treatments for their problems. And I will now show you um, one of the reports they have put online from our, our work. So we are working with several other um, treat these children. So the Montfort University is only one of these um, units working on the projects. And our work on fibroblasts from patients Is, is discussed at this point in the report. And what I want to show you here is that we have used four fibroblast lines from four probands, and they all have a different mutation. So being a big pharma company trying to cure or to find a therapeutic strategy for these diseases, it's very difficult approach, and it's probably not one of the 
approaches that you want for a sustainable growth. So this is why um, patient organizations are contacting uh, individual scientists to uh, make this uh, move forward. So we have used this uh, four cell lines together with control lines and we have identified the number of parameters that are different in 8p which is decreased mitochondrial potential lysosomal compartment and also enhanced senescent projects, we hope to we hope to be able to um, find drugs that may uh, ameliorate the phenotype of this disease. And then in terms of um, regulation, like regulatory problems, what they are trying to do is to get approvals to try certain compounds that um, are in this library with an N, on, N of 1 validated as being safe and many of them are being used for other conditions so it is what we call repurposing of drugs so clearly drug uh, repurposing contributes not um, contributes to the sustainability of of therapeutical discovery because for these diseases it would not be feasible to enter a process of drug discovery as we do in classical um, in the classical approach that I have mentioned so this is why um, I kind of try to focus my discussion on pharmaceutical innovation because that is now starting to move away from the classical model of the big pharma there are now um, various business um, that are profit or non-profit uh, models that are starting to be developed in order to enhance therapeutical discovery and the ability of patients to benefit from it. Um, I would also want to show you some of the work that I mentioned about from Katrin Hadersman, that is Professor of Environmental Chemistry. And she has developed um, a material that is able to clean um, compounds from various contexts. So this material uh, called the catalyst is able to remove organic pollutants, kill microorganisms and viruses. It's cleaning water by removing heavy metal contamination. It can also act as a catalyst in chemical reactions. So the applications that Katrin has found for it are wastewater treatment, and disinfections of contact le lenses. And she has also started to use it as a catalyst in chemical reactions that can be involved in production of drugs, particularly for um, chemotherapy. So for disinfection, um, one of the key problems with reusable lenses is to uh, make sure that there are no um, microbes present on them. Uh, hydrogen peroxide is one of the key um, compounds that is used for cleaning uh, lenses, but it appears that some um, microbes are able to resist, particularly because of their um, cysts. So their cysts are not sensitive to this treatment. So the solution that Catherine has proposed is to incorporate a catalyst in the contact lenses case and that activates the hydrogen peroxide to clean better the lenses. This has been licensed with Better Vision Solutions and it has um, other uh, patents in Australia, Brazil, EU, China, Japan, Malaysia and USA. Uh, the other uh, use of this catalyst is for the wastewater treatment. And the key problem here is that there are numerous um, compounds in the water that are coming from uh, human use. There are antibiotics that are uh, provide, uh, coming from sewer, excreted by humans and animals. 
And this is important because it promotes antibiotic resistance in the soil and that can be transmitted. There are also um, hormones that are not completely removed and they have different uh, effects on fish in rivers, turn female hormones being able to turn male fish in female fish. And there are all sorts of other uh, components that are released in the waters like zinc and cadmium and uh, lead and they are um, they have a certain level of toxicity uh, for humans so ideally we want to remove as much as possible from these compounds when the wastewater is released in waters um, so she has developed a system that is able to um, clean water, wastewater, and uh, she has tried this system in Scotland and she has found that there is a strong redu re reduction in numerous um, compounds that are released in the wastewaters. So she has found that there is reduction in oils, in phenols, and also in uh, zinc and other uh, metals that are being found in wastewaters. So this has been validated. She has also identified that the use of this uh, material is quite cheap in terms of um, for uh, over 30 years that can uh, cost very little uh, amount of money. So there are unique selling points for this material because it can be in a uh, numerous format. It can uh, have different applications. The material is made at industrial scale. And um, there is already a reactor design for incorporating the mesh catalyst for wastewater treatment. Um, the process is scalable and can be used in application from small to large, uh, from small domestic uh, applications to large industrial scale. Um, the last case study that I wanted to mention to you today is um, the work from Katie Laird and Maitri Shivkumar related to um, COVID. So, as I mentioned, Maitri joined us just before the pandemic. And in the pandemic, a lot of questions have been raised about um, the stability of the virus on various surfaces. So Katie and Maitri have worked on a number of projects. The one I'm showing you here, it's about leather, but then they have been asked to look at uh, stability of the viruses on chalk by an organization, a climbing organization. They have been asked to do uh, this test for um, cleaning of medical equipment or lab coats and um, the attire that uh, doctors are wearing in hospitals. So have, and they have done a significant amount of work with high impact on this project. In terms of the shoe industry, um, there was no information on coronavirus's stability and survival on leather. And they needed to know uh, what is uh, happening in order to be open to, re uh, to reopen manufacturing sites and to keep personnel safe. And one of the key problems here is that um, it's a manufacturing process that is labor intensive and uh, different um, personnel needs to handle the same piece of leather. So they have tried to identify uh, a solution for that. And in order to do this, they've developed um, an infectivity model for the coronaviruses using um, other coronaviruses that are um, the common cold viruses, so not the coronavirus itself. And then they have established this model and tested the different types of leather. And they have identified uh, the time that it takes for the coronaviruses to disappear from the leather. Uh, it appears that by using a coating formula, uh, the life of the virus is it's even shorter, so 24 hours using that coat, coating formula, they have been able to um, remove the viruses completely. 
the work has been published and it was uh, very important for the uh, industry because it created an evidence-based uh, model for control of infection. They gave a good understanding of uh, what is the cleaning practice that needs to be uh, applied, what is the isolation time for leather. So they have been able to put safe practices in to reopen manufacturing. And uh, they have been able also to understand uh, antimicrobials uh, use for leather to control coronaviruses. So I have given you here a number of examples in various areas showing how our research projects impact um, industry, whether that is uh, large pharma or small biotechs. But in terms of sustainability of work in industry, I think one of our key roles is also in education. So we are basically building the next generation workforce. And we have two important programs that are directed to this. We have a master degree in pharmaceutical quality by design that is uh, looking exactly at the systematic approaches to improve drug manufacturing processes, which I have mentioned before. And we also have um, a pharmaceutical biotechnology um, master course, and that is more directed towards the uh, biology, understanding targets, diseases, and how um, uh, what are the industry processes that are um, needed to uh, work in drug development in particular. We also have um, postgraduate research. Uh, besides the master, there are uh, projects that are leading to PhD that are oriented into some of these directions. They also contribute to the education of the next generation workforce. So I think this is an important thing for the industry because they get people that know um, what they need. So they get them already trained and there is only minimum uh, adaptation for each type of uh, project that they need people to work on. So in summary, we work with industry and um, small and large uh, units with knowledge partner, uh, par transfer partnerships uh, for product development in particular. We also have contract research and consultancy, and that is also for product development and efficacy testing. We apply together with industry for grants, and we also get sponsorships for different charitable pro projects. Um, I think the benefits have already come out in some of the things that I have discussed. For us as academics, um, the critical thing is to have funding for our projects. But that then builds in impact cases, research papers, and um, in many cases, intellectual property, which leads to um, patenting. For the industry, it's also important that they uh, can support uh, project development and uh, grant, grant development for additional funding for what they want to obtain. They can outsource significant parts of their projects to us. They are making savings. They use external expertise that we can provide. They also benefit from intellectual property, depending on how the uh, deals are made between academics and uh, industry. And then they benefit from the next generation workforce. So in conclusion, academia and industry research and innovation collabor collaboration is here to stay because it benefits both sides. This relation is dyna dynamic and adapts to new discovery. As an example, I have uh, looked at uh, omics and large scale data analysis, precision medicine, artificial uh, intelligence. They are already influencing this relationship. And uh, maintaining this relationship involves continuous learning and adaptation and investment in research and innovation in both sectors, academic and industry. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank my colleagues for uh, providing uh, 
the information about their work so that I can share with you. And I hope you found that uh, relevant. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak to you today. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Nicolette, for providing a, such a great presentation and with all your research valuable outputs, which gives an eye opening for all the people who are watching online. And personally, I do have a few questions to you, which when you're going through your presentation, I was coming up with a few questions which might be helpful for everyone. So the first one is uh, discussing about the digital LIO project. So in that, you're identifying that the improvement of efficiency is around 35% of the injectable drugs. So I would like to have a clarification on that, whether it's being injectable means it is so, taking as a pill or it is taking as through the injection mode um, that is my it's, it looks looking more like injectable drugs. It is more the injectable drugs. So a high percentage of the drugs, they need to be um, processed with freeze drying to be lyophilized. It's about vaccines. It's about um, biological materials. Uh, so they all need to um, be treated this way to enhance their sh um, shelf life and to also be able to transport them because if you leave the the virus vaccine in um, a liquid form then it's difficult to transport that and it's a high percentage of that so each of these uh, freeze drying processes may take up to 48 hours if we save about five of that that is a lot of time energy and waste that are um, being um, saved in this process so this is the concept. Okay, thank you. And the second one is Did treating I answer the, the question? Yeah, the second question is from my side itself. The multi-purpose material. So you are treating the multi-purpose material using the catalyst. So those catalysts are handled with the combination of water or with a different solvent. Sorry, can you repeat? Okay, ma'am. Sorry. It's a um, combination. Yeah, I, I would like to know whether it is a combination of... Water of and the different um, solvents. So it yeah. works. So um, the catalyst, it's like a fabric. And it can be used to, kill, to clean water of solvents okay so it removes oils and other solvents from uh, the water i don't know if she has tested this with solvent pure solvents to see if they are being cleaned by other contaminants okay so for the mo moment the, the testing was for uh, wastewater Okay, ma'am. One more question from the observer, and it is also from Dr. Stefan as well. Why do we need new pharmaceutical innovation approach for a sustainable development goals? Um, so all this improvement in the pharmaceutical approaches, they are saving time and energy, and they are improving the ability of the drugs to be uh, delivered as therapeutic approaches in various um, environments. So we enhance here um, our ability to do sustainable growth in various uh, um, areas, like I mentioned, the health and well-being, um, the improvement in industry technology, and also the social aspects, which are basically giving people access to treatments. So is, for example, in the malaria um, project that I mentioned from Mingzong. So by improving the ability of the drug to be um, efficient in the body, he's making this uh, available to uh, people in areas of the world that are quite poor. So that is an improvement in 
uh, technology leads to improvement in the goals. Another example is the rare diseases. An improvement in technology leads to ability to treat um, people that are not uh, being treated otherwise. So that is again an improvement in the sustainability goals. So really any technical um, achievement that is improving the ability to produce drugs cheaper and with less um, environmental impact and is giving us the opportunity to have that treatment available for more contributes to several of the sustainability goals. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. And one more question. Most manufacturer industries or former companies are struggling significantly with all the three pillars of environmental, social, and governance. Sustainable trial. So what are the and how do you comment on that? So I think the whole point of our discussion is that actually it's hard to do these improvements. And um, they are struggling because in the end, the focus of a company, their, their ability to resist is to make money. Uh, but from the fact that they support this research project, it came clearly to me that they do not give up on that. So they are trying to see what are the improvements that they can make in these areas to make improvements, really. So this is why they pay us to try to develop for them systems to do better in this um, area. And I think these days things are developing much quicker than 10 years ago. So I think in um, two or three years time, there will be um, things that are visibly improved in the way they approach um, their work to be able to do this, um, to improve on these uh, three pillars of sustainability. And um, it's not only, so it's obvious that they are interested because they are investing in it, but it's also the fact that um, there is not much more time to, to wait. So everyone is kind of conscious of the pressure, the social aspects, the environmental aspects, and everyone wants to, um, to do better. So I think steps are being made in this area, but it's true that it's not uh, an easy way. Okay, ma'am, thank you. Okay, the next question is from my side, is post-market. You have been discussing about the post-market, right? So this question is from my side. I, I'm posting it, okay. How you are collecting the data and how frequently the data has been collected so that to do the case study on that particular drug what that has been invented or that has been implemented on that particular patient how it has been done the data collection um i am not an expert in this regulatory uh, aspect so i don't really know how the regulatory bodies are approaching this um, we all know vaccines have been released. They have been in close monitoring. So I think that the monitoring is, so I think it's not, I'm not an expert in this. I think that monitoring varies depending on what type of drug it is and what is the impact on society. So I think that for COVID vaccines, that monitoring has been um, kind of ongoing until we kind of went out of it. And it's still now happening here and there perhaps not so often. For other drugs, there will be regular um, uh, monitoring steps in the first few years when they are coming out and then there will be less monitoring. The ones that we, uh, the audits that my colleagues are doing in pharmacy practice, they are um, doing, they have done an audit on uh, respiratory devices last year and they plan to do um, a repeat to see if there are changes um, in a year or two. Okay, thank you. And one more question from Dr. Stefan itself. 
and he has been uh, posted the question that what are the primary sustainable issues of pharmacy company so i think one of the key issues for pharma companies in development of new drugs is the fact that many drugs are not going through the clinical trials very well so we have heard about many attempts to um, to do uh, products for treatment of neurodegenerative diseases and that has been work going on for many many years many drugs have failed in the clinical trials step so in terms of sustainability the pharma companies might have invested a lot of money to bring those uh, drugs to the clinical stage and if some some of these drugs they fail only in the in the step three of the clinical um, uh, trials so it's like investing 10 15 years in something that doesn't bring anything back so i think this is a key problem in uh, sustainability of pharma companies so they lose a lot of money if uh, something like that happens Okay, next one is again from Dr. Stefan. And it's not only about uh, money, because all this, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, it's not only again. about money, because all these 15 years. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. So I mentioned it's not only about money. Um, it's when a drug um, is not passing the clinical trials after 15 years of investment, everything else, um, the work of people or the environmental impact um, the strategy they everything else is involved in this uh, failure in sustainability so i think this is one of the key problems okay okay ma'am the next question is again from dr stefan how can a pharmaceutical policy be developed and strengthen to reorient the innovation system and protective capacity of developing countries. Um, UK has um, developed over the last few years a number of projects that were, that it was called a global health um, project. Uh, and it was funded so that a unit in uh, UK would work with a unit in um, countries from lower development background and they were receiving funding to develop um, technologies or to develop drug products for that specific um, for a specific situation that was important for that country this is how um, many malaria projects have been developed. Uh, we had other projects in parasitology and other colleagues of mine have worked also um, uh, in projects related to this um, monitoring of uh, drug adherence. So in this way, the policy of investing in this joint projects has been designed to strengthen the innovation system in the lower developed countries. I think this was um, a good step to do. Okay, ma'am. Okay, I have one more question from my side, referring to your digital LIO project. So in digital LIO project, you are using the reduced cyclic method through which you are able to reduce the carbon dioxide and the power consumption. If that is the case, how the quality of the final product can be achieved if you are going to reduce the cycle and the power consumption as well and the carbon dioxide as well how the quality of the drug can be achieved okay. so the drug when it goes through this process of freeze drying it takes a number of hours to do each step but if you don't more 
if you we know approximately for example that this drug should be dry should be frozen in five hours but we will leave it six to make sure because we don't have a way to know if it's frozen or not and then the next step is the vacuum step so this liquid has been removed by sublimation let's say in 10 hours but we are not completely sure whether it has been removed or not so we are going to leave it another two hours to make sure it is removed so by using this monitoring system uh, jeff can detect precisely when the freezing has stopped when the liquid has evaporated and all the other parameters are okay so basically we are not changing the way the drug is processed we are only sure when the steps have been completed and normally we leave these steps to take longer to be sure that they have happened so we just reduce the time and monitor what happens there so we don't change the parameters of the drug processing we only monitor to be sure when that happens okay understood thank you and one more question from Dr. Stephen. Taking into consideration the stringence between economic development, social inclusiveness, and environmental sustainability. So, yes, the whole. Um, the whole in, the entire point of the development um, and the pharmaceutical innovation and this is why i call it pharmaceutical innovation because it has these different aspects and um i think that once the processes are in place and they become the norm like the quality by design that has been developed um in certain places but now it's um, industry in every country to perform this uh, quality control analysis and continuous monitoring. So that is really, um, so the whole process is inclusive. It's looking at the um, process development and then that has impact on the economic development. The social inclusiveness comes from the fact that once these drugs are cheaper and uh, easier to produce and they are sustainably produced, they are more available to um, countries and people that otherwise would not be able to access them. And uh, that is always related to environmental sustainability because that's the whole, pro pro um, the whole point of this uh, process improvement, to have to look at, at all the aspects. Some of them are more obvious than others, but in the end, they all interact with each other. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, one more question from my side. You are doing many researchers using the drugs on the pharmaceutical side. So, my curiosity to know about whether those drugs are directly implemented on the human beings or it has been tested on different animals and then you shift over the medicine or the drug to the human beings. So, how it has been done in your research? I like to know about that. Yeah. I I think I missed the last uh, question. Can you repeat the last sentence? Okay, ma'am. Sure. Not an issue. Okay. So you can you repeat the last with... sentence? How? Yeah. Okay. Whether you are implementing the drugs, the new invented drugs, directly to the human beings, or it can be implemented on different stages like you're implementing on the animals testing on the animals first and how the drugs react and then after that you implement on the human beings or how your research is going on okay no new drugs okay so any new drug has to go through all the steps that i have mentioned before so they are first developed and then tested in what is called preclinical testing and this preclinical testing takes place in cells derived from people. So like a piece of skin or a blood cell. So we can test them on samples from patients. Then we can test them in animal models. They can be drosophila models, but drosophila is not accepted as a preclinical model. So it has to be a mouse or a rat model for testing the drug. 
both for safety and for target engagement. And only when this has been considered safe, then there are three steps for the clinical trials. The first step is to administer the drug in a very small number of healthy people to see that this is safe. And then the second is looking um, at efficacy in a small number of patients. And the third level of testing before the drug uh, is released has to be in a larger sample of patients to see the efficacy uh, testing. So with COVID, before the drug was released for people, there have been tests in cells and mice. So you probably have read or have seen that the, the vaccines have been administered to uh, mice to see whether there is an antibody produced after the injection and how long it takes and so on. And only then there was a small group of young people that have been um, given this um, vaccine. And then the first test was to see whether it has produced an antibody effect. And then a larger number of people to see whether it actually has any effect on uh, COVID infection and um, manifestation. So it takes, that's why it takes very long time from a drug that is developed as new drug to reach the market. In drug repurposing, the drugs that are being tested are already approved for safety. So we only test them for efficacy in clinic in a certain disease. So for example, a drug that has been used for um, diabetes, exenatide, is now being used for Parkinson in clinical trial phase. It has been showing good data in the clinical phases one and two. So this kind of cuts the drug development and approval process by many years, five, 10 years. So if this is why for um, uh, rare diseases, drug repurposing is probably the way to go. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay, the next question from my side. Uh, you are discussing about the QBD, a quality-based design of research that has been done under quality your project by, quality by. Ah, so i would like to know um, more about that so quality by design is... sorry i think i missed the question so quality by design is um a system that is um, developed in drug manufacturing um, it's not directly my work. I mentioned that Professor Val Valkyria Shin uh, is um, uh, one of our experts in this um, process. So Valkyria has worked on this for many years and um, she has projects that are being um, from, uh, so different companies are coming to her and they come with a certain process that they want to have it improved. And uh, she has a line of development and she's uh, able to design continuous manufacturing improvement uh, parameters to support these companies to improve their processes in terms of time, efficacy, quality. We have looked at that project on cleaning and batching where they used a spectrophotometry and a certain specific flow cell to analyze the uh, drugs that they want to uh, send on the market. So this is the type of work that Valkyria is doing. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. And I do have one more question. So you are discussing about the validation of CLPP. So can I know the description for CLPP? CLPP? Yeah. Is a mitochondrial protease. So mitochondria is the power plant of the cells which is producing energy but is also involved in many um, other processes uh, and it's called caseinolytic protease and it works as a, a 14 unit um, protein so there are 14 units that assembles like a barrel and it's involved in a clearance of unfolded proteins in the mitochondria so by clearing unfolded proteins it's, make, it's improving the quality control of the mitochondria. 
but also it's inducing a signaling mechanism to the nucleus where it activates other chaperases and it's activating the removal of damaged mitochondria. So by preserving the activity of the mitochondria, it's improving neuronal function. So this is the, the type of work that I'm focusing on. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your knowledge. Such a long time you have taken to provide us your valuable time. And you have shared your knowledge and do hope this will bring us to our next level through which we get the students to be joining for the master program and other things so that they also come up with different research work through which we get more outputs. Thank you, Dr. Nikolaitza, once again. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I was very pleased to give you this talk. And uh, I'm looking forward for, <laughs> for further questions and the feedback. Yep. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, thank you for everyone watching online. And this is our end session for Series 5, Visiting School from APO of ISOC Research Center. And do we meet up next month for our next series of session. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you for your valuable time staying with us online. See you all next month. Thank you. Thank you.